want to record. Okay. Hi, everyone. Maria Recruit here. And it's my pleasure. It's um, December the 28th, 2020. And I have Scott McEachern on the our Zoom call. And we're going to be talking about a topic which I know many, many, many people are very interested. It's called Watch Your Step. I love the title, by the way, Scott. Snow Removal, who's responsible? So let's find out because I know in our groups, the Canadian Real Estate Investors Association, Ontario Landlords, Canadian Landlords, every group, you know, Canadian Short-Term Rental Hosts Association, they're all asking the same question, Scott. So I'm so glad that you've come on board to talk to us about it. Now, I know we've done a couple of shows about this in the summertime and nobody was paying attention, of course, right? So now it's so appropriate. So Scott, welcome to our, our Monday night uh, Zoom calls. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Maria. And if I can, and I, I'm not saying this to be a braggart or anything, but if, if I can, I'd like to share a little bit of my background on this issue and thus uh, what, what qualifies me to actually uh, speak about this. Um, so if... As you, uh, you and many of those uh, here are aware, I was the, uh, an insurance broker in my uh, past life. Um, I got in the insurance business in 1991 and started studying uh, these issues in particular, these issues related to uh, snow removal and slip and fall liability. In uh, late 1994, I hooked up with the insurance brokerage that had the endorsement of Landscape Ontario and uh, I became sort of the, uh, the lead liaison between the firm and the association and uh, got involved in other associations as well. So Landscape Ontario, many of the provincial associations across Canada, and as well as the Snow and Ice Management Association in the United States. In 1996, um, I created uh, this Watch Your Step seminar. Now, it has multiple versions of it now. The version that I created in 1996 was uh, addressing specifically issues of contractors, those that provide property maintenance uh, services and the slip and fall liability problem. I now provide uh, coaching on a, a variety of topics to lawyers and paralegals. And last Monday at this same time, um, I was doing uh, this presentation for uh, lawyers and uh, paralegals. So tonight I'm going to share sort of a, uh, a landlord version of it or a version that would be of interest to uh, those that are the owners of, uh, of properties and what they should really be uh, thinking of and be, uh, be aware of. So thank you very much for having me to discuss this, uh, Maria. My pleasure. I know everyone loves you. And I know Gail is one of your biggest fans, Gail Ryder. Yay, I'm so glad she made it. He keeps saying, we need to have Scott. We need to have Scott, you know, because I host my mastermind and Gail is in my mastermind group two. She was in my group one and group two. And she says, you've got to have Scott on. You've got to have Scott on. I said, okay, don't worry. I try to get you on, but he's too busy, Gail. But I'm so glad he's able to make it on the Monday night. So this is working out fine. So please, by all means, Scott. And hi, Dave. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Yes, it's, uh, you know, I apologize that I have been uh, so busy. We had quite a thing going on where we were doing these almost uh, once a week for, I guess, uh, a few months there. And then uh, I've gotten uh, distracted with some things. But uh, you're absolutely right. And your, uh, uh, your members are, are absolutely right in that this is an important subject that needs uh, attention and it needs better understanding. With that said, um, I'm sure over the next half hour, 45 minutes, as we uh, have this discussion, um, I'm going to leave people with just as many questions as I'm going to leave them with answers. Um, and the problem with that, or I guess the reason I should say why they're going to have more questions or just the same number of questions as answers, is that the question that people are, are, are seeking an answer for is an unanswerable question. And what I mean by that is that um, the case law and the laws that apply are always very case specific. So when people are looking for a generalized answer, hey, Scott, who's liable if somebody slips and falls on a rented property, the landlord or the tenant? There's not enough information in that question to be able to answer, uh, answer the question. There's so many factors and so many specifics that uh, apply to a given situation, but we're going to review some of those specifics so at least people are more informed and they can be aware of um, what those specifics are and they can assess and analyze their own given uh, circumstance uh, based on that. 
And you know what's so true? Because last week when we had Harry Fine on, um, it, it's the same thing. There's no yes or no answer because <laughs> what happened is we were having a debate, actually, a conversation on the Ontario Landlords Association on Facebook. And there was things going back and forth. People were asking me and I, I reached out to Harry Fine. I said, listen, listen, Harry, he's the expert on this. I said, Harry, OK, can you tell me yes or no? He says there's, it isn't a yes or no answer. And so I, he said, but you know what, how about me coming and doing a webinar? I said, yes, please do. So I know that he probably erased a lot of our questions, but it is specific, right? The law is not just black and white. It depends on the circumstance. Now I'm understanding about the law. I didn't understand before. I thought it was clear cut. Yes, no, you know, this is the way it is. But no, getting to know you and having had you on my shows for weeks and weeks and weeks, and everyone can find all of... Uh, my shows with Scott on Real Estate Media News Network on YouTube, they're all free. Just go there and you, and you can catch up on all the things you were talking about that can help you become better landlords. So I'm glad that we're talking about this because now there's snow on the ground, right? So these are questions we need to understand our rights. And again, it's not going to be such a simple answer, but try and make it as simple as possible, please. Wow. I, <laughs> Try to make it as simple as possible for me and, and my association members. <laughs> well, I, I I certainly will. But, you know, to, to lead into that is a bit of a segue. And this is a non-snow thing, but a, a, a law concept. Is that You're absolutely right. People want black and white answers. And, you know, when we think about the law, we often think that the law is black and white. And so often it's not. Even when we think of something that we perceive as black and white. If, you know, somebody were to say, hey, um, what is the law about the speed limit on Highway 401? Most people would say, oh, you know, you can't drive faster than 100 kilometers an hour. But even with that, there's still so many ifs, ands, or buts. You know, what are the weather conditions? Is there an accident or is it a construction zone going on? You know, what is, what is happening? You know, how thick is the traffic? Trying to do 100 kilometers an hour in the middle of rush hour, is that going to be speeding? No, it's probably going to be careless driving is what it's going to be. Um, so, you know, really, and that people need to stop. And, you know, I'm going to be blunt about this as I usually am when I come on your show. And I am, you know, with my friends and family as well. So this is just me being a jerk here. But, you know, people want black and white answers and they have to stop asking for black and white answers where there aren't, uh, um, you know, where it just doesn't exist. The, the law on slip and fall liability, for example, and I don't want to get too technical, but if you know somebody wants to look it up, you'll find it under Section 3 of the Occupier's Liability Act. And what's, what it's going to say is that an occupier, I'll define that in a few minutes, but an occupier must take uh, reasonable steps to ensure that persons and property are safe while they're on the, uh, the property or while they're on the premises. So when I use the word property or premises tonight, I'm going to be referring to land and structures and so forth. But, you know, what are you three... doing that, Scott? Because I have this question. I know by my members do too. Where do they find this? Where do we go to find this written down so we can go and read it? Where is it, please? Can you tell us? Sure. Yeah, the easiest place to find uh, uh, the law, uh, the resource would be using the Canly website. So C A N L I I dot org, O R G. So that's a, you know, what Canly, Canadian Legal Information Institute, is what it's an abbreviation for. Um, Canly, C A N L I I dot O R G. Um, and you'll find uh, you know, all your statutes that apply, the Occupier's Liability Act, the Residential Tenancies Act is going to be there. Um, old acts are there too as well, if you want to look things up from years past, um, as well as tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of legal cases that have been decided and, they, and published. Um, you can find tons of stuff uh, available on there. And uh, it's an excellent uh, free resource tool. Lawyers and paralegals and judges use it and the public is welcome to use it as well. Fantastic, thank you. And maybe what we could do is when I upload this, I hope this video is going to work, when I upload it on my association page, will you just come in and just write what it is where they can go and find more information, please? Thanks. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, can, uh, I can certainly do that. So <clears throat> I wanted to start off with the question that usually gets asked. People will throw out the question, you know, who is responsible for snow removal? And it's a terrible question because really it's 
two questions in one. Who's responsible for snow removal? What does that mean? Who's responsible for doing the work of snow removal? Or who's responsible if there's injuries such as a slip and fall that arise from failure to perform snow removal in a timely fashion? Okay. Those are two different uh, questions and they actually do bring about two different answers. Um, and then those two different answers actually have a lot of interplay between each other and a lot of ifs, ands, or buts, which again, in the next half hour, we're gonna find out there is no black and white clear answer, but let's help people understand the gray aspects of it so that they can assess their own situation better. It won't be a perfect answer, but at least they can better um, ask that question of themselves and assess it from there. So let's start with the uh, first question of who's responsible for doing the work of snow removal? Who's responsible to pick up the shovel, do the salting, whatever else it takes to control snow and ice is really maybe even a better way to frame or ask that question. And the answer that is not black and white. Many of your uh, um, viewers here tonight, members of your association will be familiar with uh, section 20 of the Residential Tenancies Act. That's a very broad section that talks about how a landlord is responsible for performing maintenance that uh, uh, provides for a fit uh, premise that's occupiable by a tenant. That's not the exact words, but that's the gist of it. So you have to make sure, of course, you know, running water's on, heat's on, and so forth. But also that the rental unit and rental complex are uh, fit and safe. Now, what is fit and safe? Well, fit and safe from a snow and ice point of view, that can vary. Are we in the midst of, a, uh, of, a, of an ice storm? You know, how is a landlord gonna keep the premises fit and safe, meaning make sure that nobody slips and falls when you're getting an inch of freezing rain in the next three hours when you're in the midst of it? Well, and that the law doesn't expect somebody to have summer-like conditions. It doesn't need to be dry, hot, you know, warm pavement like in the middle of uh, July. But how's that going to turn out in a, uh, in a court? I don't know when I'm going to leave that alone for the moment. Let's just put that out there that Section 20 says a landlord has the duty of maintenance, and that can include the duty of maintenance of controlling snow and ice um, on the premises. Now, when I say on the premises, what part of the premises? This is a question we need to ask ourselves because of course the Residential Tenancies Act includes a number of things when it's referring to land or the area in which um, could be identified as a premises. You have the rental unit, you have the rental complex, and sometimes the word common elements are used as well. So is the driveway of um, uh, of a, a family dwelling, a rented dwelling. Is that a common element? Is it a, a part of the residential complex? Or does the residential unit actually stretch from the inside walls to go outside onto the front stoop, down the steps, cross a walkway, out on the driveway, and even include the sidewalk out front? No, or is that now municipal property? But is there a bylaw municipal uh, that says that a resident is supposed to take care of the sidewalk in front, even though it's you know, uh, municipal property? All these things need to be thought about. Where does the um, rental unit stop and start? Or where does the rental complex and the rental unit come up and bump against each other? Is the driveway and the front walk up to the front stoop is that the rental complex and then at the front stoop and the door become the rental unit? These things, there are no, uh, there are no answers to. And if somebody wants to go to Canley, that website, and if you can find an answer that's a black and white answer that a judge has said, here's where it stops and here's where it starts. And that's absolute, no ifs, ands, or buts. You know, uh, Harry Fine and myself, we would love to see that case. <laughs> and we know it doesn't exist. <laughs> Oh my God, I feel so sorry for you guys. I mean, I, I could never be a paralegal, right, Gail? I mean, we could never do this because it's just so complicated. It's like, I mean, you guys have to keep up to everything new that's coming up. 
and they're always throwing new things at you, especially now with COVID-19, things are changing around as they're going. Like I could never do it. You have to be reading constantly, just like an accountant has to keep up to date with everything, you know, it's tough. It's, you know, being a paralegal is not easy. It certainly isn't easy. Yeah, it's one thing that uh, just came to my mind was, um, yeah, I mean, if we had some clear answers on what determines a, a rental unit when it comes to that driveway and walkway space, um, that would help us make a game plan. Like, for example, if I, okay, I include my driveways with my single family and duplexes, and I include parking for free. But, so does that mean I'm responsible for shoveling? Is there one way out of that is, is if I rent the parking spaces, like I charge them for parking spaces now. So now I'm free of, okay, that you're renting that. I, like, you know what I mean? Is there a way? I don't know, because there's no clear answer, right? Well, Gail, there is no, no clear answer other than the answer I'm going to uh, uh, share with everybody. You want a game plan? that reduces your your liability and you know i'm a former insurance guy and that's what i look at you know are you really trying to figure out hey i don't want to have to shovel so is there a game plan to keep me from having to shovel or are you really trying to figure out hey um i want to make sure that whoever is doing the shoveling you know whether it's supposed to be me whether it's supposed to be the tenant you know i'm protecting myself from a two million dollar liability suit both you know like okay. Okay, both, both. All right. I need answers to both of those. I'm, I'm not physically capable of shoveling. I have rotator cuff in my arm. I'm not capable of doing it. Um, so I wouldn't physically myself as a landlord be able to do that. Um, so I put it in their leases that they do that and agree to it. And I have them sign that. And I, but I do offer all the salt and ice melter, shovels, sand, okay. all that for free. So that's another issue too. I'd like you to address. Well, and uh, I'm going to address it in a way that you're not going to like, Gail. <laughs> okay. Now, regardless of a uh, you know rotator cuff problem or whatever, you know a reason that a landlord may not be able to actually physically, the landlord himself or herself actually do the workmanship might be a physical uh, issue such as rotator tater cuff, or it might simply be distance. Hey, you could be a landlord that lives in Calgary with a bunch of Toronto properties. You're not going to jump on a plane and fly to Toronto to shovel everybody's driveway every single time it snows. And that, you know, you're going to probably contract, you know, that out or as many try to do, find a way to make it so the tenant is supposed to do that workmanship so that you don't as a landlord have to come do that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem. And, the, and in fact, I'm going to offer the, the solution, first of all, and this goes back to my, uh, um, insurance beliefs is that simply a landlord should say, Hey, you know what? I don't like all these ifs, ands, or buts where lines are drawn, this, that, and the fact that I might get hit with the $2 million liability suit if the pizza guy trips and falls or slips and falls, you know, on snow and ice and snow and ice that he may or didn't see because the lighting wasn't that great and the ice is there because of the slope of the driveway is pointed like this towards the front and I as the landlord haven't changed the slope and all that kind of other stuff. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. It's not just about snow falling from the sky. There's other factors that come into play here. I've already hinted lighting, slope, these things can have an effect. So the, ultimately, why doesn't the landlord just simply say, hey, you know what, I might not like it, but I also wouldn't like a $2 million liability suit and having to pay increased deductibles, increased insurance premiums, and maybe even find myself to the point where my insurance company says, sayonara, go find another insurance company. And then I'm running around talking to 10 different brokers and I can't find a broker that can find an insurance company that'll take me because every insurance company now has me blacklisted knowing that, hey, I tried to shift the duty of snow removal over to my tenant contrary to what the residential tenancies act says and contract uh, contrary to just good risk management of somebody that owns a bunch of properties uh, or even if it's you know for those viewers that just have have one property so i'm going to emphasize that landlords and you might not like this but this is my viewpoint you should be doing it and that why because then you're also in control and that rather than having these you know, nervous concerns where all these people that I'm looking at here on the screen right now are logging in to see what Scott's going to say is the answer is who's responsible for snow removal. And that make yourself responsible for it. Now you know the answer. 
And now you have control over how well it's done, who you're hiring. Are you hiring, you know, Joe, the fly by nighter to come out and shovel when he gets around to it? You know, and I'm going to be sarcastic because up to two o'clock playing poker, drinking beer with his buddies and can't get up at six o'clock when it starts snowing. Or are you hiring, you know, ABC Landscape Inc., and it, who has you know 50 trucks on the road and formal contracts and proper insurances and so forth and that who are you getting to do the snow removal if you're getting a professional uh, corporation that you're you've uh, or a, a property maintenance company that you've researched and you've made sure that they have the experience they have the equipment that they have the manpower that they have the insurances etc to do this and they've been around for many many years well, Section 6 of the Occupier's Liability Act, again, not to get technical on everybody, but that's basically the, I'm going to call it the immunity clause within the Occupier's Liability Act, where an occupier, such as a landlord or property owner, contracts to a competent, independent contractor, and that contractor is subsequently negligent in performing the workmanship, the property owner being again a landlord is immune from liability. Now you probably still need to defend yourself on that basis and, um, and your own insurance company is probably not going to go to a, an extensive um, effort to defend and have to bring in expert witnesses to declare that particular property management company and all your diligence and making sure the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted in hiring that maintenance company. Uh, demonstrate that you had done your due diligence on a five thousand dollar claim and that somebody slips and falls and breaks a fingernail and that if somebody slips and falls hits the back of their head and they're going to be a vegetable for the rest of their lives and that you know you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars and maybe even into the millions and that because it actually costs more to take care of somebody that's a vegetable than it takes to actually take care and write a check for somebody that's dead and that, this is my bluntness that gail loves <laughs> Blunt um, too. Gail is blunt too, and I'm blunt. So we appreciate it. We're just trying to get to the truth, right? Gail, we're yeah, just figure it out. That's all. We don't mind you being blunt. Go right, go right ahead. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Exactly. These are the kind of things that people need to be thinking about. And if we think about it from that perspective, why wouldn't you want to have that kind of control? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to be able to have in your hip pocket Section Six of the Occupier's Liability Act, which is basically that immunity clause? Hey. I decided I'm going to hire professional contractors and protect myself, you know, in the case that uh, uh, there is a serious uh, injury that occurs due to a, a slip and fall or a trip and fall on my premises and, you know, slip and fall due to snow and ice being the topic for uh, tonight's conversation. Okay, hey, Scott, I had a, a question though with that. Um, on the boards just today, I think Maria, maybe it was on one of your boards or one of the landlord boards, somebody's uh, contractor that they had, landlord hired a contractor to come and do snow removal. That person got sick and tired of the tenants not moving their vehicles. So every time you go by to clear the snow, they'd never move their cars. So we just forget it. He dropped them as a customer. Now he's scrambling to try to find somebody else. Some of, some people like live in smaller towns and you can't, it's just not that many people to choose from. So like, you know what happens there if you know now they're, they get, maybe it takes them a couple of weeks where you can find someone else to do it and what if someone trips and falls there like there's got to be some there's got to be some ownership on the tenants in that case i think yeah we well, always want we want the tenants to have ownership but it, but it, in the end of it all it always comes back to us we're always to blame right scott i mean that's the problem oh well, yes 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 and no and that so i i like the example that you just brought up gail and um you know, Section 64 of the Residential Tenancies Act, that's the section that deals with the right to seek eviction of a tenant who's interfering with the landlord's rights. And where a tenant interferes with the landlord's uh, legal rights, in, including and especially significantly interfering with the landlord's ability to, um, or the landlord's contractor's ability, to perform something as serious as uh, proper snow removal operations and therefore help protect the landlord against serious uh, liability risks. And that I'd be pulling an end, you know, calling up a paralegal saying, draft up an N5. I want this person evicted for interfering with my rights and, you know, exposing me to major slip and fall liability. Mm -hmm. 
and that and you know I, I would hope that an adjudicator at the landlord tenant board sees that as a pretty significant and serious uh, serious concern. Um, you know, it'd be the same as the uh, landlord who is providing a premise that has a, a pool and the tenant decides, hey, I'm going to chain the fence, the gate to the fence open. I'm violating the, the law. You're supposed to, you know, protect a pool from, you know, toddlers next door being able to walk in there and, you know, fall into the pool and drown. So, you know, in that particular type of situation, you got tenants that are putting the landlord greatly at risk and, you know, landlords don't put up with that. You got the power of Section 64 of the Residential Tenancies Act working for you. Use it. That's good. That's good. It's good to know. We need to understand our rights too, Scott, you know, and this is why I, I wanted you on my shows and have other paralegals also, because we need to know what our rights are so we can actually go to the board and say, look, this is, you know, this is violation of section such and such and such. And, and if, if it was up to me, I would get a paralegal involved, Gail. I mean, let's say just for example, that person that you're responding to, or you're going to respond to in the future, you say, you know what, get a paralegal on your side to drop the right paperwork and to represent you. So they say the right thing at the right time. Pretty basic, right? Because we don't know. I mean, I don't know, right? And, don't and know. avoid saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Of course. <laughs> that can be quite a, quite a bit of it quite often. Um, <laughs> if, if I can, I'm going to just get, jump back here. So I was talking earlier about, you know, where does the landlord's portion of the premises stop and the tenant's portion start? Because there's actually two aspects of the Residential Tenancies Act that address this. Section 20 of the Residential Tenancies Act, as I explained earlier, that's where the landlord has the maintenance duties and that to perform you know, the maintenance of the rental unit, the rental complex, including the common elements. Then you have section 33 of the Residential Tenancies Act, which says the tenant has a duty of cleanliness of the rental unit. But what again is the rental unit? Is that just the, you know, from the inside of the door in, or is that including the front stoop or any walkways that are for the exclusive use of that tenant? Or again, does it now include the driveway that's for the exclusive use of the, of the tenant? You know, these things are, are, are subject to significant debate. And, you know, that debate and the fact that these are gray areas, there's no black and white answer that I can provide, no black and white answer that I know of that is on Canley or in any of the, uh, the case law that's going to explicitly state that. So therefore, it leaves you with no black and white answer to the Occupier's Liability Act. And I wanna emphasize this, landlords, I see this all the time in your, uh, in your groups, Maria, where landlords are talking about the Residential Tenancies Act as if it's the only thing that exists. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> you know. It's a paramount act, and that in that it typically um, stands over and above uh, other statutes and, and so forth. And, um, but there are uh, statutes that it interplays with and one of those is the Occupier's Liability Act. So the Occupier's Liability Act, landlords need to, to know that. It's not a long act, it's fairly short. There's a few complicated sections in it, but a, a good paralegal and every landlord should have a paralegal, you know, basically on speed dial that's on their, uh, on their, uh, on their hip ready to go at uh, you know, the drop of a hat when one's needed. And that, you know, that's local and somebody comfortable that you feel with. So paralegals will be able to explain what the Occupier's Liability Act and how it works and how it interplays with the Residential Tenancies Act. And what I suspect they will end up telling you is that an occupier can include the landlord, the owner of a property or anybody who has care and control of the conditions of the premises. Now, when I throw this out there, and, the, and there is case law that kind of throws a, a, a monkey wrench in what I'm about to say. Now, when I throw this out there, most landlords say, well, then if I find a way to shift the care and control for snow removal over to my tenant, such as using a, a separate contract because the Residential Tenancies Act doesn't allow you to actually include it directly in the lease, unless you have what we call severable pr provisions or a separate contract where you're hiring your tenant as an independent contractor. Mm -hmm who's probably not the expert professional contractor we've talked about before, so they're not going to qualify under Section 6 of the Occupier's Liability Act as a competent contractor we're talking about that can give a landlord immunity. However, 
And that care and control of what? Is it just a snow removal? And that if it's care and control of the conditions of the premises, that involves much more than just the snow and ice that are on the premises. Because when somebody slips and falls, if I'm the personal injury lawyer for that person, I'm saying that the landlord failed to maintain the snow and ice, the tenant failed to maintain the snow and ice, the landlord and the tenant failed to maintain the lighting system outdoors, that there were only 60 watt light bulbs instead of 100 watt light bulbs, and therefore the pedestrian who slipped and fell and suffered the injuries, suffered those injuries because of not only the snow and ice, but the lack of proper lighting. I'm going to be alleging that the slope and the runoff for uh, uh, for icing conditions and for water on that property all contributed to the slip and fall and that the landlord's negligence or the landlord's failure to maintain those premises in a way that didn't have, you know, little curbs or whatever that kept the, the water from running off the, uh, the walkway contributed to that slip and fall by allowing snow and ice to accumulate all that sort of stuff, I'm going to, you know, as a personal injury law, lawyer, if I was one, uh, I'm going to be including in that, uh, that case. And at that point, the definition of an occupier under the Occupier's Liability Act captures the landlord, and that the landlord has the duty of maintenance per the Residential Tenancies Act to ensure that uh, the premises are, uh, uh, are maintained and safe and fit. Mm -hmm. We only have six minutes left, right? And I'm just going to repeat to everyone, you can always um, hear more that Scott and I have, we've done many, many shows about this particular problem and many others. You'll find our Real Estate Media News Network on YouTube. Please go and, and uh, look at it there. But Scott, we have six minutes left. Is there anything you can tell people about where they can find more of this information or how they go about learning more themselves. Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, this particular topic, I've written many articles that are syndicated on uh, various uh, websites that people can find, websites that the uh, paralegals or owners of those websites are commonly uh, um, posting that information in your various groups. So, you know, th these things shouldn't be uh, difficult. This shouldn't be difficult information to uh, to research. The Landscape Ontario Association has many articles on its website on these uh, topics. And uh, for, for those that have a pen and piece of paper handy, let me give you a, a quick list here right now of some things to uh, do a quick Google search on and, and look up. Okay. So uh, if you don't already know, and you should know it off the top of your head if you're a, a, a genuinely a serious real estate investor and landlord, you better know section 20 of the Residential Tenancies Act, section 33 of the Residential Tenancies Act, and section 64 of the Residential Tenancies Act. Next, the Occupier's Liability Act. You wanna know section one, section three, Section six, section eight, and section nine. And you want to know those inside and out. And if after reading them yourself, you can't figure out what the, the government's really trying to tell you, then pick up 1-800, uh, your favorite uh, paralegal friend, and uh, pick their brains on it. Now, every one of you, again, should have a, a, a paralegal on your, on your speed dial. Yes. And they can help you better understand, you know, what these, uh, what these concerns are. I, that's yeah. what, you know what we have some members in my mastermind natasha who has her paralegal and speed dial and myself if i had a problem i'd be getting a, a hold of my paralegal but can we not speak to our insurance broker insurance agent about this also scott we can, if you, yeah if you have a, a well-versed uh, commercial insurance broker your, your typical home and auto insurance broker that, uh, you know, some landlords will, yeah, I know you're shaking your head and I'm glad you are, but some landlords will run to, you know, Joe Insurance that did their car when they first turned 16 and they're still with 20 years later with three rental properties. And, you know, Joe is a home auto life RSP mutual fund. He's, you know, he's got a sign on the door that says he does absolutely everything, which really means he does nothing with uh, any real depth to it. But if, if you run to a, an insurance broker that focuses on, um, you know, landlord issues or specifically occupier liability uh, issues, yeah, you can get a lot of uh, assistance there and risk management hints and tips, 
both from an operational point of view as well as you know even a, a contractual point of view. Insurance brokers have a, uh, uh, as part of their job description, uh, a duty to provide risk management uh, um, to their clients, risk management services. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. And and the, for yourself, Gail, with the mastermind, you'll find out that I'm going to be uh, giving you some information about where you can find or you work with lawyers, top-notch lawyers that won't cost you an arm and a leg. Okay. So we're going to be getting into that in, into our uh, into our mastermind. But before I close up now, because you only have two minutes and twenty six seconds, Scott. So just bear with me. <laughs> Does anyone who wants to know more about this information, certainly you can get a hold of Scott on our on our Ontario Landlords Association Facebook page. He'll respond to you there, but he doesn't take on clients. Is that correct, Scott? You don't take on clients. Correct. I, I work as a uh, what I call a legal <laughs> practitioner coach. So lawyers and paralegals are my clients. If they have questions, they need uh, counseling, coaching, some research and writing assistance. Uh, they're my clients. So if you do want to access me, you actually should go through your lawyer or paralegal. If it's just an off the, you know, off the cuff, we're not really talking about a genuine situation. We're just, you know, uh, talking over, over a coffee. I, you know, I'll sometimes throw a, um, you know, some direction as to where you can find an answer there, but if it's specific, I can't. Yeah, I know what I mean. I really appreciate you uh, going on my, my Ontario Landlords Facebook page. So it's called Ontario Landlords Association Facebook page. It doesn't cost you anything. It's free. And Scott will answer questions there. He'll step in. I mean, he doesn't come in, at, you know, he only comes in as being a, an assistant uh, and a coach to other paralegals or lawyers. But he does share the articles that are on very, you know, various pages of paralegals. So please, by all means, do read what he has to say. And, and um, right now we just have a minute left. I just want to say thank you very much, Scott for being my guest today. We'll have you on again because you, you're wonderful. You know, you, <laughs> you get us thinking and you certainly make me think about the law a little bit differently. So I, I don't want this to close off on everyone, but listen, happy new year to all of you. You want to reach out to me and join my mastermind by, oh, I know it's never enough time with Scott Gill. I agree. There's never <laughs> enough time with Scott. It's always like that, but listen, everyone take care. It's Maria Recruit here from all things real estate. You can find me on on Facebook, on all the all the social media. Reach out if you want to join my mastermind starting in January. I have some members here that are part of that group. We always look for new people to come in. So thank you, Scott, very much. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Ashwin. Let's see who else is here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. I've got so many people here. Thank you for joining me and please join in next Monday. We're going to have another topic that you'll find very